Good morning, TGP, TGP Global. So glad that you could be here. I know that God is going to show up and is going to speak to us in some way. So whether, whether you're watching online or whether you're in the house, we know that he is here. Well, happy Memorial Day for those of you that are in America and, and we celebrate, we remember um, those who gave their lives uh, to protect our land. Lots of crazy stuff happening, but we are going to take a moment and focus in worship. I want to encourage you to um, stay in touch with us. We want to encourage you to continue your giving and participating with the ministry. Let's just pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that you have called us and created us to worship you. So as we worship you in spirit and in truth, we ask that you, by your Holy Spirit, would do something magnificent. And so God, here we are. You have our affections and you have our attention. In Jesus' name, amen.
call the sea to still the rage in me to still every way at your name Jesus Jesus you make the darkness tremble Jesus Jesus you silence fear Jesus Jesus
We're singing, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. All of the things that seem to just loom over us, all of the darkness, all of the clouds, all of the, the unsureties, the things that we don't know. God, Jesus, you make it tremble. At the name of Jesus, all of those things have to come down. They have to bow. But it takes us acknowledging that in our lives first. Oh, Jesus. So if you don't know what to say right now, if you're unsure, if you're just like, I don't even know where to begin, start with Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. And as you call on his name, strength begin to rise. Jesus, Jesus. One more time, say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh Lord, we call the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus.
now as we, we sing and we cry out to God for, for chains to break and for fear to bow. Think of it that even within our lives, Christ has to be able to be close, which requires us to be intimate. It requires us to be close to him. If we stand far away and we're like, okay, fear about, it's not as effective as if we're right here with God, really close. This next song talks about us wanting to be close, to be in his presence, to know him more and more each day. And I'm just reminded and even compelled to remember that, that my time with God is important. My time to be close to him is important and it cannot just be on a Sunday morning. Day by day, being in his presence, day by day hearing from God, day by day seeking God and asking him what he wants me to do moment to moment, second to second sometimes because I can't think long range because if I do, I forget. But to be close, day by day dwelling in his presence, getting so closely acquainted with who God is and how he wants me to live life. It's not just being close to him, it's, it's the fact that he sits on the throne. And because he sits on the throne, he rules over everything. Every situation that you could ever face. When we're close to him, when we're with him, he's close to move on our behalf. And I'm not saying that he won't move on our behalf if we're distant, but the intimacy with him gives us the, the, the ability to be patient gives us the ability to just know that he's close and that he's working on it, even when we don't feel it or see it. So I want to encourage you this morning, draw close to God. Do whatever it takes. If it means leaving that job or leaving that person that just keeps sucking you in and pulling you away from him, I dare you to trust the fact that God loves you and that he's got your very best interest and he just wants you close. If that's you this morning, I just want you to take a moment. Just acknowledge it. If that word was for you, acknowledge it. Say, okay, God, I'm sorry. God, I've made you small in my eyes. God, I've made you just like this minor little thing that I do from time to time. God, you're so much more than that. God, I want you to be the center. I want you to be the big picture of my life. I want you to be the lens that I see life through, that I filter my life through, Lord God. God, I want to be so close that before I think, say, do anything, God, I hear what you say. I can know your heart, your will for me, God. God, you're pulling us into so much more. You're pulling us into another level. And God, I believe that that level and that new place with you requires intimacy. And I speak to my generation specifically, God, you know how much we struggle with intimacy, with being close, with trusting, with having faith. But God, that is exactly what you are about. So Lord, would you restore our ability to trust? God, would you restore our ability to have faith in you, God? Not in people because they'll fail us, but God, in you, you are incapable of failing us or letting us down. And because of that, God, we can truthfully and honestly say, God, be all the glory and honor and power. It's all yours, God. There is no one else that compares. God, hear the cries of our hearts, God. Lord, I feel like I can't even go on without you, God, at this point. God, we need you. So God, as we wait, as we're here, God, we will just exalt your name. We will lift you up, God acknowledge where you are seated on the highest place, ruling over us, God, ruling over our situations, ruling over our 
our challenges, ruling over our deficits, ruling over the things that we have no control over, God. To the one who sits on the highest throne, to the one who reigns forever, God, be all of the glory. We give it to you this morning, God.
the one, to the one who sits upon the highest throne, to the one who reigns forever and ever, be all the glory, be all the honor and the power, be all the glory, be all the honor and the power we give you glory we give you honor and the power 
as we've worshiped, it's so wonderful to know that we can present our cares before him. Um, there's been lots of this been happening in Texas, the, um, the Rob Elementary School um, disaster and the families that are grieving. And so I just wanna take a moment for us to pray for that. Father God, we thank you that you um, are moved with the things that moves our heart and, 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 and breaks ours even as we are for the things that break yours. And so Father, we just wanna bring um, the families of the bereaved, of those children whose lives were snuffed out, Father, we don't understand, and yet we thank you that you do, and you grieve and you care, and, and you bring solace, and, and you comfort the brokenhearted. So Father, we just ask that as we stretch out our hearts um, in grief and, 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 and distress, Father, that you hear. So God, be with the families, encourage them, give them hope again. And we give you thanks. Father, we thank you for the word that's coming forward. And we just ask again that, that you would give us the ears to hear, the hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this week we have a really special guest. He's no stranger um, in the house. Um, Chris Potts is with us. Chris, um, you know... Um, Every week or so, we get together and, and we talk about the issues of life and ministry. Um, and he's a dear, 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 dear brother of mine. So, Chris, um, it's all yours. Go for it. And our hearts are ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. I uh, have a question for you today. What do you think is the most well-known passage in the Bible, even to people who don't read the Bible, people who do not take faith seriously or practice it regularly. Can you think of any verse or passage that almost everyone is familiar with? We'll come back to that. In the meantime, three people who had very little in common. And I wanna look at the one thing that they did. One is Mary. Uh, the mother of Jesus. And if you look in John chapter 2, you'll find the famous story of Jesus' first miracle at the wedding in Cana. And apparently Jesus did not go to the wedding in Cana planning to do a miracle, but one was called for. And his mom decided it was his time to step up. So she asked him, she explained the situation, and then she said something very interesting. She turned to the servants who were handling the wedding and she said to them, whatever he says to you, do it. That's quite a confidence. Is there anyone in your life that you could say that about with such confidence? But Jesus' mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Then there's a fellow named Peter you may be familiar with. And in the book of Matthew chapter 14, the famous story of Jesus walking on the water. You may remember that all the disciples watched him do that from the boat. But Peter was the one who asked if he could join Jesus walking on the water. And Jesus said, certainly, step out and come to me. And Peter did. Is there anybody who could invite you to step out on the water and you would do it? The confidence of that. Come on out. And Peter got out of the boat. Third fellow. We don't even know his name. He was a thief who died on a cross alongside Jesus. It's recorded in Luke chapter 23. That as he died, he looked to Jesus and said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus famously replied, Today, you will be with me in paradise. And all evidence is that the thief believed that. It's one thing for one healthy man to ask another healthy man. It's another thing for a fellow dying a horrific death to
to look into the eyes of another man dying the same death and say, would you save me? I believe that you have a kingdom beyond this. Would you take me into it? To have the confidence to ask that and the confidence to believe that he did. Three people, each with an unusual confidence in the same person. Jesus, Mary's faith, Peter's faith, a thief's faith. Where does that kind of confidence come from? Where does that kind of assurance find seed and begin to grow? I don't know today if you have a great deal of faith and confidence in God. I don't know if you have the song we sing about, the blessed assurance. But if you don't, or if there's some particular area of your life where you need that assurance, I'd like to look at the possibility today of a way to cultivate that, a way to find it, perhaps in a way that you haven't before. So, Father, we ask that you would be with us today. We ask that you would have mercy upon our troubled souls. We ask that you would give us courage for the things that frighten us, faith for the things that intimidate us, trust for the Lord who's bigger than all these things. We pray for a new confidence. We pray for a blessed assurance that you are our Lord, that you are our guide, that our lives are in your hand. Give us a new hope and a new joy in believing that today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. From Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. That's a remarkable joy and confidence. The psalmist who wrote that is overflowing with trust, with a happy security in his God. And again, I would ask, where does that come from? I think there might be a little clue right in the middle of the psalm itself there. It says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Does that phrase ring any bells for you? We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. I asked a moment ago what you thought the most familiar verse to people who are not familiar with the Bible might be. And it could be John 3.16. It could be something else, but I rather suspect the most common passage that most people know a little something about is the Lord is my shepherd, the 23rd Psalm. So I'd like to look at that for a moment because I think there may be a reason why Psalm 23 resonates so deeply, so broadly, so powerfully with so many people. I wonder if there are some clues in that famous passage that speak to the assurance we all want to have so much. So Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is one deep psalm, and we could study that all day and into the next year, looking at all the possibilities. So this is not going to be a comprehensive survey of Psalm 23, but a few thoughts. And some of them are going to take you back to your high school days. If you remember your high school algebra, 
I don't remember a lot of high school algebra. I didn't remember it when I was taking high school algebra, but uh, I do remember this one uh, equation that they drilled into us. Uh, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Do you remember that one? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. On that note, let's look at A. Verse 1, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. If A, then B. If the Lord is my shepherd, if I am the sheep of his pasture, if the Lord is my shepherd, A, then B, I shall not want. One thing leads to the other thing. If the Lord is my shepherd, if he's not, if I'm going my own way, all bets are off. But if the Lord is my shepherd, A, then I shall not want B. That's quite an assurance right there. I shall not want. It's also interesting to me, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Two different verb tenses. I used to teach English, so we're getting into my neighborhood now. The Lord is my shepherd, present tense. I shall not want, future tense. The future tense, what's going to come in my life, is derived from the present tense, what's going on right now in my life. Because right now, the Lord is my shepherd. In days to come, I will not want. Look at the rest of these first couple of three verses. They're all, you notice, in the present tense. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me, even now, in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. All these things are happening now. And because the Lord is my shepherd, making me lie down right now, leading me right now, restoring me right now, I will not want in the days to come. I will not want for purpose. I will not want for provision. I will not want for our fellowship. I will not want for all the things my soul longs for. Because the Lord is my shepherd and looking around now, I see how he's already working in my life. The God who will work in my life in days to come. You look at these and it's kind of interesting, I think, the order. If I were doing the order and if I were listening to most of the sermons from most of the preachers that I hear, the order would be, the Lord's my shepherd I shall not want. He leads me in paths of righteousness. God has things for me to do and he's going to show me how to do them. And after I've done them, after I've completed whatever the Lord's called me to accomplish, then he will make me lie down in green pastures and lead me beside still waters and restore my soul. There'll be a time of work and then there'll be a time of refreshing. That would be the order I would expect, but that's not the order of the psalm. First comes the lying down and the still waters and the restoration of my soul. The rest comes before the work, before the paths of righteousness. It's interesting. He doesn't give us something to do until he's rested us and readied us to do it. And it's also interesting because if I don't let him rest me now, I probably won't let him lead me later. I'll be tired. I'll be worn out. I'll be weary and recalcitrant and stubborn and not want to go. But a Lord I can trust to rest me to rest my soul and quiet my mind and bring peace to my heart now. That's the God who will lead me in the paths of righteousness. The things that are happening now, God is using to prepare, prepare me for what will happen then. It's interesting, this kind of echoes to me another passage you may be familiar with, John chapter 14. Some words Jesus spoke at the Last Supper with his disciples. John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way, you know. Again, the order of that's interesting as Jesus is talking to his disciples there at the Lord's Supper. He starts with, let not your heart be troubled, the lying down in green pastures, the restoring of the soul. Let not your heart be troubled. And at the end, he says, the way you know, the path of righteousness for his namesake. That same pattern. First comes the rest, the trust, letting him bring peace to my heart. And then comes the work, the job, the challenge. Moving back to Psalm 23, if you look there in verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. You notice something changes here. In those first three verses, there's a sense of uh, distance a little bit, as if David is observing what the Lord is doing in his life. I don't know if you've ever been in a car wreck, um, or if you've had the same experience I have, but the time or two when I've been in a car wreck, it's like my mind split into two different positions. And part of me is spinning the wheel, stepping on the brake, seeing what's happening, trying to save the car. Another part of me almost steps back and just sort of folds my arms and is watching and says, you are so going to hit that car. Oh my goodness, you're going fast. It's like it's observing what's happening and deciding what to make of it. And David is almost that way in the first two or three verses of Psalm 23. He's watching what the Lord is doing in his life, but there's a little sense of detachment about it. If you notice the ver or the term, he says, he makes me lie down, he leads me, he restores my soul. But then beginning in verse 4, it changes from he to you. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Suddenly, it's not detached anymore. There's a relationship. He's talking about a God he knows and not just a God he observes. It's very interesting. Um, I love the verse from 2 Timothy chapter 1. I know whom I have believed, the Apostle Paul says. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep what I've committed to him until that day. It's not, I know what I believe, it's I know who. Paul says, I know who I believe and I'm putting it all in his hands. And David is coming to that same realization in Psalm 23. It's no longer the Lord, it's my God. When I was a little boy and my father was talking to me about accepting Christ as my savior, and he was talking about something I had studied in Sunday school, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And my father asked me if I believed that. And I said that I did. He said, you believe that God loved the whole world? I do. He says, you're in the world. Yes, I am. He said, he didn't just die for the world, he died for you. And I think something like that is what David is realizing. It's not that God is good and he's merciful to people. God is working in my life. I see what you are doing in my life. And it's interesting, again, the order of this. It says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
we would assume you deal with all the difficulties of God's helping me with this, God's helping me with that, these other things, to the point that even when death comes, God will. But David starts with death. Even though I walk, present tense, I'm walking right now through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. Again, what I'm seeing you do right now gives me the confidence for what you will take care of later on. Notice what God's taking care of now. It says your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rods and staffs are for poking and prodding sheep who are getting out of line and moving in the wrong direction or headed off to a dangerous thing. They're tools of discipline. And I've had the Lord use those in my life when I'm making a mess of things, when I'm going off the beaten path a bit, when I'm wandering away from where he wants me to go from what's best for me. He uses that rod and staff to discipline me. I've seen the Lord deal with my sin and my confusion. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. To have a table in the presence of your enemies, you have to have enemies. The Lord has helped me with the people who wish me harm. He's delivered me from those who would have destroyed me or hurt me. He's dealt with my sins. He's dealt with my enemies. And then it says he anoints my head with oil. Anointing is something in the Bible that's done to show the purpose God has for someone's life. A special calling, a special opportunity, a special responsibility. When I'm lost and confused and I don't know what God wants me to do, what I should do next, where I should go from here, the Lord provides that illumination, that sense of purpose, that sense of direction. And my cup overflows, which we take to mean the blessings are so abundant that they just keep coming. They overflow the cup. There's, there's more than I know how to handle, which is true. But there's something else that happens when a cup overflows. You get a mess. You have to clean up where the cup overflowed. And the same Lord who helps me when uh, I need discipline, when I need help with my sins, when I need help with my enemies, when I need a sense of purpose and direction, the same Lord helps me with even the little messes of my life today. He guides me in working through those things too. All these things, David says, I'm looking at what you're doing in my life, God. And you're taking care of my sins, and you're taking care of my enemies, and you're taking care of my problems and my messes, and my confusions. Why would I think you would not take care of the issues of life and death? Why would I not believe that the times of my life are in your hand? A equals B, B equals C. If God is taking care of these things, I can trust him to take care of those things. And then comes the third verse, or I'm sorry, the last verse of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Two future tenses there. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. This is the conclusion. If the Lord is my shepherd, then I will not want. If I will not want, if he's going to take care of my problems and my messes and my sins and my enemies, if he's going to give me rest for my soul and quiet restoration, if he's going to lead me in the path of life and righteousness, if he's going to do all those things, why wouldn't I trust him, a God who's so in control of my here and now, why wouldn't I trust him for my tomorrow? Why wouldn't I trust him for my eternity? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. A word about that word follow. Follow actually literally means here pursue, chase, run down. 
God's mercies chase after me in the course of the day. It's not, it's not just they're there kind of floating around if I happen to bump into them. God sends his blessings after me as I move out into the day. You know why you have to chase somebody? Because they're running away. Why would I run away from the goodness of God? Be still and know that I am God, that I love you. Be still and let my blessings catch up to you. Let them show you how good I am and how much I love and care for you and for what concerns you. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. If today is in his hands, tomorrow is in his hands. That's the blessed assurance. Today is in his hands and I can trust him for tomorrow. John chapter 10 verse 27 Jesus says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me I give them eternal life and they will never perish I give them right now present tense eternal life and what's more future tense they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to take them out of my father's hand i and the father are one lord we thank you that you are bigger than the things that concern us the horrors of life the fears of life the intimidations of life the pains and discomforts and confusions of life. None of these can snatch us out of your hand. Your blessings are chasing after us. Your mercies are all around us. And the God who is comforting and guiding, strengthening, blessing us today will comfort and guide and bless and strengthen us tomorrow. We pray, Father, for this blessed assurance to know with all that we are who you are to trust in your love for us to trust in your goodness to walk in your ways may our eternities be a wonderful surprise and delight and may today be not only bearable but cause for rejoicing because you are our shepherd, and we do not want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey everyone, thanks so much for being here and worshiping with us. Uh, we had a great time in worship and we really hope that you did as well. Uh, we really hope that you just continue to stay connected with us. You can connect with us at TGP Connect on Facebook and Instagram, and you can also find us on YouTube. We hope that you continue to give uh, in this season and every season. Uh, it's something that continues to support the church and the mission that's going on here and also around the world. So uh, we hope that you continue to give in this time. Thanks so much for being here again, and we hope to see you next time. See ya.